lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. That's kind of what we're going to get into in this episode of the Stark Reflections podcast. I'm calling it Publishers and Predators. You see, there are things you need to be leery of as an author. You need to be cautious of. You need to be aware of some of these pitfalls in publishing. And there are some pitfalls when it comes to publishers. And there's definitely pitfalls, lots of them, when it comes to the predators out there in our industry. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 202 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I am going solo again, and I am sharing a couple segments of a book I have been working on. On and off, I've been working on my next book in the Canadian Werewolf series, which is Fright Night's Big City. I've been co-authoring The Relaxed Author with Joanna Penn, and I'm also working on publishing pitfalls for authors to avoid. And as I was working on uh, one of these chapters this morning, I thought this would be an important thing to share with you awesome listeners. So what I'm doing is this is the first draft that has not gone to my editor yet. It hasn't even been rewritten. It's the first draft of uh, the segment of it. So what the publishing pitfalls for authors is, is using alliteration, using P's like the seven P's of publishing success. I have outlined approximately 30 or so different P's uh, that are pitfalls. Um, so two of those are uh, publishers and predators. And I kind of talk through things to be careful about when you're uh, looking at working with a publisher in terms of the contracts, etc. And then uh, the pr- proliferation of predators in the market. So I thought I would share that as part of this episode. So that's coming up later in the episode, but first we're going to jump into a word from this episode's sponsor as well as comments. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Now, Findaway Voices is a platform that allows you to get your audiobook out into the market. If you're looking for a professional narrator to use, you can use Findaway Voices. They will assign a project manager who will work with you to find between 5 to 10 professional narrators from a variety of price ranges that they think would be suitable for your project. That saves a lot of time of having to listen to unlimited auditions from different people or people who want to work on your project, which is kind of the way that it works with uh, ACX, or at least has been my experience. I prefer going with Find Away Voices and the professionals who help narrow down those professional voices. Similarly, if you're looking to expand into 43 plus retailer and library markets and you have the rights to your audiobook, you can use Find Away Voices just for distribution. One of the great things is you have control over your prices, which is quite fun and exciting. And you can take advantage of promotions through places like Chirp, which is BookBub's audio book platform. So if you're looking for ways that you can leverage Findaway Voices as an author, check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. In terms of comments that I'm going to talk about in this episode, I want to say a huge, huge thank you to uh, the patrons who responded to a special Patreon-only edition of the podcast. So something happened last week, and I got really angry and really frustrated about unprofessional author behavior. And I uh, I originally started to write a post uh, that I was going to post to the Wide for the Win Facebook group because there's a group of wide publishing authors looking for advice there. Uh, I kind of wrote something and then I looked at it and said, yeah, it's a little bit hot-headed. I'm going to not post that. That's not very professional of me. <laughs> but I wanted authors to know. So I thought, I'm going to take this. Um, I deleted the post, then I turned on the microphone, and I just recorded myself kind of working my way through the anger and the frustration and why 
this behavior upset me so much. And then I posted that to Patreon because I thought, okay, a small core group of people who understand uh, what I'm about. And uh, and, and I asked. I, I ranted and uh, I got a little bit uh, angry. Uh, used some adult language that I would normally never use uh, in the podcast. And uh, I got some amazing responses from my patrons. So, uh, and I hope I didn't miss anyone here because I don't have the list in front of me, but I've got uh, either comments directly uh, on, on the Patreon feed or, or direct emails uh, from, from folks. So Connor Whiteley, Faye White, Joanna Penn, Johanna Rothman, Julie Strauss, Linda Hill, Roland Denzel. Thank you guys so much. I uh, there's so many comments I was going to read, um, uh, but I didn't ask permission, especially since you know private emails and Patreon um, the comments. I was going to read your comments, but in a nutshell, what uh, people kind of thought some of the things I said were funny <laughs> in terms of uh, boggles my uh, effing mind was one of the things that I said, uh, but um, they commented that, um, because I did, at the end I said, hey, let me know, is this is this useful for you? I'm sharing it because I care about you guys. And, and, and the feedback seemed to be towards the end of, you know, maybe you should clean this up, um, you know, take out the swearing and, and some of the anger, and, and you should talk about this. This should be something that authors need to understand. Um, and, and so that was kind of like the, the overwhelming majority of the comments lent towards uh, that this is something I really need uh, to talk about. So thank you guys, uh, Connor, Faye, Joanna, Johanna, Julie, Linda, Roland, and and, and if, if you commented and I missed your name, I'm so sorry. Uh, but thank you guys so much uh, for, for the comments and the feedback because it reminded me of why I'm doing this podcast. I'm doing this podcast to help authors. And so thank you, patrons. What I'm going to do, I'm putting out a special very short episode between, well, shortly after this one, probably a, a few days afterwards. Uh, it's going to be another solo, and it'll be um, yeah, a different version, sort of. Uh, my patrons got to see the raw, unedited, <laughs> early draft, uh, and the rest of you awesome listeners, you'll get to, uh, you get to hear the little bit more refined, polished um, that, because I think it's really, really important uh, for authors to understand. And so thank you uh, to my patrons, all of my patrons, for supporting the podcast over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. Thank you to my awesome listeners. Thank you for being a listener. You don't have to be a patron to support the podcast. You can support the podcast by leaving a review or sharing it with someone that you think would find value. But I do want to say a special thank you to my awesome uh, patrons for the feedback, because that reminded me of why I'm doing this podcast. Um, and, and that's almost kind of led to wanting to do this episode. Now, I'm doing uh, this particular episode because I have been shortchanged in terms of time. I'm working on multiple projects. I'm trying to sneak in a little short mini vacation, uh, overnight camping trips and things like that. And uh, actually editing uh, the few, I think I have three interviews in the can. Editing those interviews uh, takes a lot of time and effort and creating the show notes. And I did not have time for that. So I thought, as I was working on this book uh, this morning, I thought, why not share this with my listeners so they can benefit uh, from some of these insights. So again, the content that you're going to see coming up is from uh, my forthcoming book that's coming out in... uh, I guess it's August. It's coming up very soon. Uh, so, And I do have a deadline uh, to, to get that manuscript uh, to my editor next week. And I have a lot of writing to, to continue to do. But it's not going to be a full-length book. It's only going to be about probably um, somewhere in the fifteen to 20,000 uh, word range, depending. It could end up going a little bit longer. We'll see how that uh, shakes out in the next week as I wrap up the first draft of that. But you're getting access to... A couple of the pieces, the first draft, two of the important pieces from the book, because I love you, dear listeners, and I want you to have this content. So without further ado in the introductory matter, here is uh, Publishers and Predators from Publishing Pitfalls for Authors. Publishers. Publishers, real publishers, from the traditional and literary perspective, are persons or companies that produce and distribute copies of books, newspapers, magazines, etc. for sale. 
they are responsible for curating and selecting the works to be published. They assume the risk of production and publication costs. They edit and publish the author's work and provide distribution and marketing of that work. They normally pay in advance to the author and ongoing royalties based upon sales of that work. In any case where the money does not flow to the author, you aren't dealing with what I call a real publisher. You're dealing with some sort of vanity press subsidy publishing company that is trying to masquerade as a publisher. They engage in nefarious and deceptive practices in order to trick authors into believing they are signing their rights to a legitimate publisher. Please read more about them under Predators. When it comes to actual publishers, just because a publisher is assuming all the risks and the costs of publishing, producing, and distributing a book doesn't mean that there aren't pitfalls to avoid when working with them. Below are a few of the publisher pitfalls to be aware and cautious of. Contracts. It's critical that you remember that a contract is a negotiation and is not set in stone until both parties agree upon the details and sign them. Publisher contracts are typically cookie-cutter templates filled with a number of boilerplate rights requests. Some of the clauses put into a publishing contract are there by default and can easily be struck or modified. All you need to do is ask. And yes, you can and should ask for anything that you are not comfortable signing. I learned this after reading Christine Catherine Rush's 2013 book, Deal Breakers, Contract Terms Writers Should Avoid. She since revised the content from that book into the 2016 book, Closing the Deal on Your Terms, Agents, Contracts, and Other Considerations. Now, reading that 2013 book provided me with the understanding to request 12 changes to a publishing contract I had signed that year. The publisher accepted 10 of the 12 requested changes. Now, the last two weren't deal breakers for me, just nice to have items. And so I was set. So some of the clauses and things you should look out for in a contract are formats. Publisher contracts are by default going to be as open to the publisher having all rights regardless of whether or not they actually exploit them. They might, for example, request audiobook rights without ever having produced a single audiobook. This can go for other formats as well. If they request a format that you know they don't produce, you can request striking that format from the contract so you're free to offer it to another publisher or publish that format yourself. Language. Similar to the above mentioned, publishers might request rights to all languages regardless of whether or not they're actually ever publishing in that language. If they don't publish in the other language or languages and aren't specifically offering you money for those rights, there's no need for them to lock up those rights. Remove this clause and free yourself up to sell foreign language rights directly to another publisher. Option. The right of the publisher to acquire the publishing rights to the next book by the author. This usually comes with the author agreeing not to send the work to another publisher or publish it by other means. Be careful of this. Right of first refusal. Similar to the option right mentioned above, publishing contracts often have a right of first refusal clause that requires they be offered the next book or books that they can decide to publish or reject before the author sends it to another publisher or publishes by another means. Rights reversion. When you sign a contract with a publisher, it's typically allowing them the rights to publish your book. But when and how do these rights return to you, the author? Is it a fixed date? Is it dependent upon a measurable factor such as sales quantity in a specified time period? How can an author initiate the reversion of rights? These are all things to pay attention and attend to. Confirmation bias. There are two ways that confirmation bias within a publishing house can be a pitfall for writers. The first is related to the marketing that a writer puts into your book. With the exception of smaller publishers with limited budgets, the amount of money a publisher will spend on marketing your book when it is published is typically proportional to the advance that you receive. If you are a beginning or mid-list writer who has received a modest advance in your publishing contract, the investment in marketing your book is likely to be similarly modest. Internal publicists and marketing departments within publishing houses are often leveraged to ensure that the publisher earns back the investment made for each book they publish. For example, if your advance is $1,000 US, but that same publisher offered another author $100,000 US, Guess which book is more likely to receive the majority of time, attention, and care from the PR, marketing, and sales teams from that publisher? Which book or author are they more likely to spend most of their time and energy on? 
The second way that confirmation bias can affect an author is in the acquisition process itself and the way that the publisher reacts to author submissions. Publishers, editors, and agents are among the brightest, most passionate people in the book industry. Many of them come with decades of dedication to publishing. However, even with all this experience, insight, knowledge, and passion, they still make mistakes. Regardless of all of the curation and analytics and gut versus calculations that they make, only about 20% of all the books that they publish earn money. Despite this, they believe that they know better than anyone which genres, topics, styles are hot and which ones are going to be blockbuster bestsellers. They often reject fantastic books because they believe that nobody is reading that any longer or that was hot three years ago, not now. Remember that publishers aren't publishing books to sell books directly to readers. They are acquiring rights to publish books that they are trying to sell mostly to chain and larger bookstore buyers, specifically to fit within a four-season selling cycle of the book industry. That's very limited. Nobody is reading that any longer might actually be their way of saying, when we pitched a book like this to Barnes & Noble buyers, they didn't order enough copies of it. Each year, thousands of excellent titles get passed on by publishers due to this. The same is true for the next element below. Conflict of interest. As more and more smaller publishing houses have been absorbed into large international conglomerates, publishers have reduced the number of books they publish due to them not wanting to create as many conflicting titles to split the vote of the consumer. For this reason, publishers will often reject perfectly fine books, not because they don't have any merit, but because the publisher recently published a book in that category or with a similar topic from that or one of their sister imprints. This means that they regularly reject submissions, not based on how good that book is, but because they aren't able to fit it into a constantly tightening and limiting list of titles they can publish in a specified time period. Again, just because a publisher rejected a manuscript doesn't mean there isn't an audience for it or that it's not worthy of being published. They might have rejected it because the potential conflict of interest with another similar title they already have scheduled for release in a forthcoming quarter or year. That book could do quite well, but they're not willing to invest in it. Marketing. Authors often state that they want a publisher because they don't want to do their own marketing. The reality is that publishers will only market a book typically for the first month or perhaps as long as the first three to six months of a book's release. It's more often the first month or even first few weeks of a book's release. This is because the publicist that the publisher has in-house, or perhaps even hired as a third-party contractor, has limited time to spend on each new release. While your book is precious and a special baby to you, the publicist might be working simultaneously on a handful or dozens of other authors and titles being released in that same time period. Your book is not likely to be the center of their attention and efforts for more than a very limited time period. Remember, as mentioned in Conflict of Interest, the publicist is more likely to be investing in a much more intense fashion in any of the big-name authors or authors who have received a much higher advance for their book. So, if you're thinking that having a publisher means not having to do any marketing, you, my friend, are sadly mistaken. Predators. Predators are one of the most significant pitfalls facing authors. Yes, I know I teased it out at the very start of this book because alphabetically it comes along much later, but I was also tempted to produce this chapter in bold, all caps text using at least an 18 point font. It may seem dramatic, and I wish I didn't have to be dramatic about it, but that's just how dangerous and prevalent predators are in the book industry. And there are predators working within almost every aspect of writing and publishing. Regardless of whether you choose traditional publishing or self-publishing, the water is rife with them. Over the years, they've been known under different terms. Vanity publishers is an often used term that has appeared as early as 1941. Here's an excerpt from a 1958 Library Trends article by Howard A. Sullivan called Vanity Press Publishing. Subsidy publishing has risen to its present statistical eminence from the debacle brought about in 1941 by the federal government's conviction for mail fraud of C. A. L. Fluimani, who exemplified vanity publishing at its classic worst. 
Flumiani, the head of Fortunis and at least two other publishing firms, was accused of having mulched some 500 would-be authors of a total of $250,000 in publishing fees by holding out the lure of lush financial returns from sales of books and promising big promotion campaigns and, and expert editing. The promotion turned out to be a line in a catalog, and the editing was done by a high school girl who accepted all legal manuscripts, up to 25 of them a day. He also ran a literary agency which, for a small fee, would place a manuscript with one of his own firms, a lecture bureau which registered authors at $30 a head, no lectures were ever booked, and something called the Associated Publishers of North America, which attested to the reputability of all his other firms on an impressive letterhead. During his last 18 months in business, Flumiani issued 117 books and paid out $75 in royalties. A few days after Pearl Harbor, he was sentenced to 18 months in prison, but he had provided a point of departure for a special kind of publishing enterprise which could not be fully exploited until the war ended. The article goes on to state that Flumiani was not tried for vanity publishing, which was not, and is still not a crime, but for conducting a vanity publishing business in an illegal manner. But he and others like him definitely set the stage and proved that it was a lucrative business. For perspective, that 250000 U.S. dollars he fleeced authors for would be the equivalent of about $4.6 million today. No wonder these outfits are able to prosper despite aggressive and expensive marketing campaigns to get in front of authors. These vampiric-like entities prosper and continue to flourish because they prey so brilliantly on the hopes and dreams of writers. They appear to answer the universal desire to be published or to have a publisher. They also offer mostly useless smoke-and-mirror promotional packages that offer that other thing that seems most elusive to the majority of writers, marketing and publicity. These predators have always been around in both traditional publishing and self-publishing circles, and over the years they've continued to adapt their business strategies to evolve as the industry itself has evolved. Their business model appears to be all kinds of things, and their own marketing efforts are powerful and convincing even to the most skeptic and sharp authors. But it's mostly made up of one sharp focus. Taking money from authors. No, let me rephrase that taking more and more money from authors by making over-exaggerated and even false promises. Their business model is typically one where 80% of the revenue comes directly from selling services to authors. They might earn as much as 20% from the sales of books, but that's usually because of the hard work of their authors spending even more money on marketing, often even outside the already mostly useless marketing packages they sell. Let's take a step back and look at how such businesses can operate, why there are tens of thousands of them out there, and also why, like cockroaches, they'll likely still be here regardless of how the industry continues to evolve. As a writer, you've probably encountered that common response from non-writers, that they've always wanted to write a book, or they have an idea for a book, or something along those lines. Most people have that innate desire to write a book. Most people, of course, never will. Why? Because it's damn hard. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of determination, hard work, and hours. But one of the things that these vultures rely on is that most people love the idea of having written and published a book. That's a huge demographic. Particularly since the majority of these people will never bother to give it a try unless there's some easy shortcut to becoming a published author. And that's what much of their marketing material plays upon. How easy it is. They do all the work. In some cases, they even just interview the person and hire a ghostwriter to craft the book. Simply insert five to 10000 or more dollars here and you too can be an author. Easy peasy. There is a significant amount of money to be made right there. And an endless supply of clientele that will never dry up. But when it comes to Actual authors, those who have done the work and written a book, they come along with the two main promises that are most alluring and difficult to look away from. Being published by a publisher, marketing, and promotions. 
let's make sure we understand what a publisher, a real and proper publisher, does. Within our realm of discussion here, traditionally, and borrowing from the Canadian Oxford Dictionary, a publisher is a company that produces, distributes copies of books, newspapers, magazines, etc. for sale. Now, the greater term of publisher, of course, is the action of making information, music, literature, software, and other content available for free or for sale. Technically, you are a publisher of content via blogs, YouTube videos, even the various social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and others. There's something truly elusive and compelling about saying that you have a publisher. It seems to come with some sort of prestige and feelings of worth and importance. When you are able to use the term, my publisher, in a sentence, it appears to come with an air of nobility. But let's not forget, within the commercial realm, a publisher selects the works to be published, typically based upon the raw manuscript's merit, assumes the risk of all the production and publication costs, edits and lays out the author's text, provides the ISBN as well as registration of the book's copyright or national library listing, as well as marketing and distribution. The publisher typically pays the author an upfront fee, called an advance, for the right to publish the author's work. Ongoing payments, or royalties, are paid on a predetermined schedule based on the sales of the work. American author James D. MacDonald coined a phrase known in certain literary circles as Yogg's Law. Money should flow toward the author. This is a rule that I think applies so well when it comes to these predators. Money should flow to the author. If the money flows from the author to the publisher, and I use air quotes there, then you're not dealing with a real publisher. You're dealing with a predator. And these predators are brilliantly creative and deceptive. They're good at masquerading as publishers, but need to be seen for the wolves in sheep's clothing that they really are. One of the most recent name changes I've seen these scam artists use is hybrid publisher. But over the years, they've used descriptive phrases like subsidy publisher, cooperative publisher, or collaborative publishing. But once you're familiar with the signs, it's easy to detect predatory publishing companies. Here are a few things to look out for. Posing as a traditional publisher. Some vanity publishing outfits will actually call themselves a real publisher on their website or refer to themselves as a traditional publisher. No real publisher ever has to call themselves that or even refer to vanity publishing because no real publisher likely ever worries about being seen as a predator. If anywhere on their website they state they aren't a vanity publisher or are a real publisher, I always adapt Hamlet's the lady doth protest too much, methinks, perspective, and that something more is going on here. Be leery. Promises up front. Often on a publisher's website, there are details about what types of manuscripts they accept, the range of time they're open for submissions, their preferred format, and sometimes expected response rates. Vanity publishers often have few of these, but are filled with numerous promises of the sales, prestige, and money that will come from publishing with them. Pay attention to those. That's often a sign. Terms such as co-op or partnership or hybrid or shared costs or joint venture. Use of these terms is typically evidence that the vanity publisher is going to require money from an author. Remember, their profit comes not from selling books, but selling services to authors in order to publish. They reach out to you. It is extremely rare that a publisher will email or call you to offer you a publishing contract out of the blue. Yes, it can happen. And it really does play into our dreams, desires, and somewhat narcissistic belief that we are that one in a million author that publishers will be fighting over. Like those sleazy and pushy companies looking to offer furnace or air duct cleaning by showing up at your door or calling you out of the blue. There's more in it for them than for you in cold calling authors. Avoid them. Chances are they're not what they're pretending to be. References, referrals from agents slash editors. If an editor, publisher, or agent you submit a manuscript to replies with any sort of, this is excellent, but it just needs some editing work, and then refers you to a service or sister company or referred partner or whatever with a fee for that service, you're most likely dealing with a predator. They're very likely either in partnership with or receiving a kickback from the vanity publisher. 
avoidance. Anytime you have a reasonable question for one of these vanity publishers and they avoid the question or refuse to give you a clear and concrete answer, they're likely trying to hide something. Distribution and print on demand. Real publishers tend to have real relationships with warehouses and bookstores. They most often print and warehouse books that are available through wholesale distributors and are easily available for bookstores to order and to return. While some legitimate publishers use print-on-demand POD technology, they often have bookstore-favorable terms and existing relationships for books to be easily accessible by and available in bookstores, meaning on bookstore shelves and not just an online listing. One way to determine if a publisher is likely a predator is that they mention where their books will be available. Real publishers don't have to state this. You can also call your local bookstore to see if they have any books from a particular publisher or are able to order any in, and that will be a good indication. Ordering. Whenever a publisher has details clearly stated on their website requiring ordering of author copies, it might be evidence that their business model isn't to sell books to readers via bookstores, but in selling books to authors directly. That's their service, selling books to authors, not selling your books to readers. Pressure. A real publisher won't pressure an author into signing a contract. They likely also won't phone an author. This is typically because they have thousands of other manuscripts sitting in the slush piles in their back rooms. Anytime that a publisher requires that you reply immediately because this is an offer available only for a limited time, they're playing upon your fears and desire to be accepted and are more than likely counting on that pressure to override your natural, cautious logic. You need to remain cautious. You need to remain logical. Don't cave in to the pressure. A resource that I recommend every writer bookmark that, they, that can help authors determine if a potential publisher is really a predatory company is Writer Beware, co-founded by Victoria Strauss and available as a resource via SFWA, Science Fiction Writers of America. The website and resources are easily searchable online, but over at marklesley.ca slash publishing pitfalls, you'll find a handy link. One last thing to keep in mind is that there are legitimate and honest operating vanity publishers that exist. They are typically ones where the fees and the services they charge for publishing an author's books are clearly stated up front. They clearly outline what they will do and offer in order to help prepare, publish, and distribute a book prior to an author having to even contact them. These companies are not predators. They are merely service providers operating with transparency and integrity. They're not to be mistaken for predatory publishers. Predatory publishers, again, are the ones that are there wanting to trick and deceive you into you believing that you're signing with a legitimate publisher. And that's where the predatory nature comes in. And that's what I highly recommend you avoid as a writer. Well, that's the end of episode 202, Publishers and Predators. Love to hear your feedback about what you thought. Uh, do you find these uh, previews or sneak peeks of works in progress that I'm working on? Do you find those valuable? Did you find something to reflect on about either publishers or about predators in this? You can leave your comments over at starkreflections.ca. You can also at me on Twitter. I'm at Mark Leslie. So... Until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.